testing. Good morning. Welcome to First Parish in Hingham, also known as Old Ship Church. I'm Jack Gomez, a member of the Board of Trustees. As Unitarian Universalists, we gather here as an open community that honors freedom of belief, encourages spiritual growth in ourselves and our children, and shares the wisdom of the many religious traditions with reverence for the earth and in service to humanity. We gather here on the ancestral land of the Massachusetts and Wampanoag peoples, the original nations of this land who continue to cry out for justice and self-determination. We are mindful that for Wampanoag and Massachusetts people, of any, every generation, this land is sacred. We welcome you to bring all that you are, your beliefs and traditions, your identity, your story, and the wisdom of your years to this congregation. You are welcome here. If you are visiting or newly attending our services and feel comfortable doing so, we welcome you to stand and share your name with us so that we may offer a warm welcome. All of us are welcomed to gather for coffee and conversation at 14 Main Street. Please note in your order of worship this week's schedule of events here at Old Ship. If you have any questions, please stop by our welcome table at coffee hour also, any member of the board will be happy to answer your questions. We're happy you're here with us today. If you're looking for inspiration, comfort, or connection, we hope you will find it here. Our morning service will now begin. Let us worship with our eyes and ears and fingertips 
Let us love the world through heart and mind and body. We feed our eyes upon the mystery and revelation in the faces of our brothers and sisters. We seek to know the wistfulness of the very young and the very old, the wistfulness of people in all times of life. We seek to understand the shyness behind arrogance, the fear behind pride, the tenderness behind clumsy strength, the anguish behind cruelty. All life flows into a great common life if we will only open our eyes to our companions. Let us worship not in bowing down, not with closed eyes and stopped ears. Let us worship with the opening of all the windows of our beings, with the full outstretching of our spirits. Life comes with singing and laughter, with tears and confiding, with a rising wave too great to be held to the, in the mind and heart and body to show to those who have fallen in love with life. Let us worship and let us learn to love. Good morning. Uh, I'm Elaine Gomez, and my pronouns are she and her. I light the chalice with a question today, a question about righteous deeds. I begin with the Epistle of James 2:14 through 26. Of what value are those who say they have faith but do not have works? If a brother or a sister is naked, destitute, and hungry, and you say to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not also clothe and feed them, what good does it do? Therefore, faith alone, unaccompanied by righteous deeds, is dead. Other religious traditions have the same message. We are brothers and sisters, and our faiths are entwined. The heartbreaking news of the wars in Ukraine and Gaza fill the airways. War. As a species, war has always been with us, as have periods of peace, and both are possible at all times. So righteous deeds, how can we here help? How do we help our brothers and sisters? How do we serve peace and comfort and strengthen each other? This, to me, is the main question. We're talking about a variation on sin today, and we will start our uh, worship appropriately with number one, hymn number one in the Let Nothing Evil Cross the Store. Please rise if you're able.
time for a worship for all ages, a story for all ages. Uh, are there any children or any people who want to think of themselves as children? Anybody's welcome to come and sit down here if they want to, or just stay where you are. So I don't see a rush for the for the front. We'll uh, give you this little piece of wisdom from Aesop, the great Greek collector of morality stories. This is called Belling the Cat. You know what, what Belling the Cat means? You're going to know in a minute. Long ago, the mice had a general council to consider what measures they could take to outwit their common enemy, the cat. Some said this and some said that, but at last a young mouse got up and said he had a proposal to make, which he thought would meet the case. You will all agree, said he, that our chief danger consists in the sly and treacherous manner in which the enemy approaches us. Now, if we could receive some signal of her approach, we could easily escape from her. I venture, therefore, to propose this small bell be procured and attached by a ribbon round the neck of the cat. By this means, we should always know when she was about and could easily retire while she was in the neighborhood. This proposal met with, met with general applause until an old mouse got up and said, that is all very well, but who is the bell the cat? The mice looked at one another and nobody spoke. Then the old mouse said, it's always easy to propose impossible remedies. Sharing of joys and concerns, we have Claire Petrie coming forward. And I'll do the candles. Do we have the candles? Hmm? Do you want to do the candles? Does, what, um, yep, Put, push that out. Hold, no, you got to push this up. And, and you can light it from that candle that's already lit. Does anyone want to share a joy or concern with the congregation this morning? I see, no, I see a hand going up back there. Right. There's no uh, computer. I can shut. Give us your name. And... Hi, I'm Corey. Good morning. So I just want to express a joy and some gratitude. Both my mom and my son, who I know members of this congregation have been praying for, are doing really well this week. So I want to say thank you. Okay. Oops. Watch this. As long as I'll learn where the speakers are sooner or later. I'm Patty. I'd just like to thank all of you for the best wishes for my husband, Roy. He had a stent inserted and he's has not had any more strokes, but he still has other issues. So we'll be in North Carolina for quite some time. Thank you. We have somebody back here. Oh, yes. Um, I'd like to light a candle, um, I'm sorry, Trish McAleer. I'd like to light a candle um, in celebration of our LGBTQ community. Um, this past Wednesday was National Coming Out Day. And, oops, I'm sorry, on the 11th, I'm sorry, it was the 11th. But I do want to um, say a word about uh, the ongoing work of our welcoming um, congregation committee. Um, we need to get out to support them. Um, it seems like the committee has really dwindled down. So I really, really want to please um, encourage folks to um, try to make it to the meetings and the events that are going on throughout this year. Thanks.
Well, we're so excited to be here with you and to see you. This is my son, Eric, and he decided to take me on an ancestor trip. So uh, my, how many greats is it? <laughs> what? A lot. A lot. My great, great, great grandfather was a deacon here many years ago. And so uh, we're so happy to be here with you. And I just think that our ancestors, despite their trials and their struggles and their joys, that they paved the way for us. And I'm so excited to be here with you. Thank you. If I may, uh, Roy Harris, and uh, I'd like to light a candle of joy from Eileen and me for our granddaughter, Rosie, who is about to turn five in December and who has learned how to set up the cuckoo clock in, uh, in their room. So we're very happy for her in Queens, New York, and the cuckoo. My name is Ralph Brown, and I would like to light a candle of celebration for this magnificent October morning. Um, from Zoom. Uh, from Ellie Handelman, uh, a candle of joy for participating in the Jubilee 3 training with three other members of Old Ship. I'm not seeing any more hands. I would like to light a candle or if this virtual candle left um, for anyone who may be connected in any way to someone in Israel or Palestine in these last few days. It's very trying, I can imagine. But my heart goes out to you. My door is open. My telephone is there. If you want to talk to somebody about it, please call me. Um, but please know that this church gives its sympathies to everybody who is in harm's way. In that, in that area of the, of the world. Thank you. Now we'll have a moment of meditation and silent reflection. Amen.
morning's reading is from John Calvin's masterwork, The Institute of Christian Religion, written in 1536, Book 2, Chapter 1. Therefore, original sin is seen to be a hereditary depravity and corruption of our nature diffused into all parts of the soul. Wherefore, those who have defined original sin as the lack of the original righteousness with which we should have been endowed, no doubt include by implication the whole fact of the matter, but they have not fully expressed the positive energy of this sin. For our nature is not merely bereft of good, but it is so productive of every kind of evil that it cannot be inactive. Those who have called it concupiscence, a strong, especially sexual desire, lust, have used a word by no means wide of the mark. If it were added, and this is what many do not concede, that whatever is in man, from intellect to will, from the soul to the flesh, is all defiled and crammed with concupiscence or to sum it up briefly, that the whole of man is in himself nothing but concupiscence. Here ends the reading. My apologies to Chris that I didn't notice and we did, he got left out of the uh, order of service. So the, Chris Meyer is the one giving us the music uh, for this morning service and doing a magnificent job. Thank you so much. And now we'll take the offering. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Davaline Cooper and I'm chair of the Social Justice Council here at Old Ship. This month we begin our special plate collections once a month for organizations outside of Old Ship who serve critical social justice needs and services. This month, we are supporting the Hingham Food Pantry. The Hingham Food Pantry is an important safety net that serves Hingham families in need. Susan Kiernan, the volunteer director of the Food Pantry, was scheduled to be with us this morning. However, Susan's sister-in-law passed away this week, and she is in New Jersey for the funeral. I know we send our love and prayers to her and her family. Um, she sends her regrets and she asked me to convey to the Old Ship community how appreciative the food pantry is of our many years of support. In a message she sent to me, uh, Susan said, and these are her words, we are so grateful for the support of Old Ship with both food and monetary donations over these 32 years. Staples like crackers, cereal, pasta, and peanut butter are an important part of every grocery order that we thankfully receive from local food collections. Special plate collections like yours allow the pantry to provide, in addition, much desired fresh produce. In fact, Kate Philman of your church can attest to this as she regularly packs produce for our Monday deliveries. We are also welcoming more culturally diverse local foods, local families to our food pantry, and your generosity allows us to provide some familiar foods for them in addition to our more traditional American foods. We also use the monies you donate for, di for diapers. SNAP and EBT benefits, formerly known as food stamps, do not cover paper products, including diapers. I cannot begin to tell you how relieved parents are to know that their babies will be dry and well cared for. We couldn't do this and so many other things without you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now to my words, 
Our offering this morning, unless it is designated otherwise, will go to the Hingham Food Pantry. Donations are also accepted throughout the month of October online through the donate button on the Old Ship website. One additional way to support the food pantry is through donations of food. And we do have a box in the vestibule of the Meeting House and at 14 Main Street for donations each week. And next week, we are asking everyone to bring a food donation, our own food drive, if you will. And we are asking you to bring, at the food pantry's request, either pasta sauce, spaghetti, or a healthy cereal. Either bring it to church next Sunday or drop it off at the meeting at the at 14 Main. Thank you in advance for supporting our neighbors in need. Amen. Calvin and original sin. This morning, we're going to take a deep dive into the transgressions of our past, try to answer the question, was slavery America's original sin? This might not be what you were expecting to talk about today. Our hearts are grieving with a Second Middle East War, got to, got to get the text down. Our hearts are grieving with the second full-scale war starting in the Middle East. There may be people in this room who have loved ones in harm's way. We have a near total paralysis in the House of Representatives just when they need to be responding to the president's urgent request for funds for humanitarian relief. In this church, we are get, grappling with more mundane problems trying to assess how we can be more welcoming to marginalized people and what to do about a new parish house and when to start doing it. These are pressing and highly emotional concerns. So it may seem strange to you that your minister wants to talk this morning about a theological doctrine which has been around for two millennia, but which most liberals abandoned gleefully two or three years, two or three centuries ago, by which I mean, original sin. Like the doctrine of the Trinity, 
the doctrine of original sin is deeply entwined with our liberal history. And while we say we have abandoned it, I'm going to wonder out loud this morning whether it may be creeping in the back door. Let us start with the basics. Our Unitarian Universalist denomination results from a consolidation of two separate denominations in the year 1961. Both Unitarianism in its American branch and Universalism arose in reaction to Calvinism two centuries earlier as part of the social and cultural and philosophical movement known as the Enlightenment. What is Calvinism? It is a theological, philosophical system which has had great influence on American culture as well as the culture of many European countries. As doctrine, Calvinism can be expressed in five phrases. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. If you want to remember this list, think of the word TULIP as an acronym. Total depravity means all humans were born in sin and could do nothing about it. Unconditional election means that God has selected who is to be saved well before they were born. Limited atonement means that Christ's death on the cross doesn't save everybody from eternal damnation, but only a limited few. Irresistible grace means that if you are one of the lucky ones destined for heaven, God's grace will act on you even if you actively resist it. And perseverance of the saints means that those people who are saints continue in some form of existence after death. The Puritans, who were our ancestors, were Calvinists, as were many Presbyterians, Baptists, and Methodists. I speak of it in the past tense, but it is still quite influential on the American religious scene today. The Great Awakening of the early 17th century was an outbreak of Calvinist sentiment, which sparked liberals led by clergy such as Ebenezer Gay of this church, Charles Chauncey of First Church in Boston, and Jonathan Mayhew of the West Church in Boston to quietly reject much Calvinist doctrine, basically out of disagreement with the first proposition that all were inherently depraved. They took a position called Arminianism, that whether you ended up in heaven or hell in the afterlife had a lot to do with the way you lived your life here. Arminians had a hell, but they thought that life gives you a way to avoid it. By the way, the three liberal ministers I just named would have been called congregational ministers in their day. The word Unitarian was a put down used by the more orthodox until early in the 19th century when the liberals finally accepted the name Unitarian. Universalism was founded on the principle of universal salvation. And Universalists disagreed with Calvin in their belief that all souls would eventually be reconciled and united with God. There used to be a sign on the Weymouth UU Church, which was originally a Universalist church on 3A, proclaiming the essence of its attraction. The sign read, comfortable pews, no hell. <clears throat> How did the idea of original sin come into being? <clears throat> it's not original in the sense of being authentic or not a copy. You may remember Tom Lehrer's line in the Vatican rag, rag, step into that small confessional where the guy who's got religion will tell you if your sin's original. Not that kind of original. Original here means having to do with origins, with a story of how the human race came to be. Many cultures around the world have origin stories. The word Genesis means origin, and the two stories it contains about human origins are the origin stories of the Bible and of Western tradition. Remember that there are two of these stories in the book of Genesis, and in the first one, creation takes place in seven days, and there's no sin or moral fault. In fact, at the end of each day, God looks at what he has created and pronounces it good. It's the second creation story, which has Adam and Eve and the serpent and the Garden of Eden. Now, the first thing to note about this creation story 
as it is found in the Torah, so it's Jewish scripture. But the Jews do not read it the same way that the Christians have read it. Original sin is a Christian idea arising from a Jewish scripture. In the story, God had told Adam and Eve not to eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or they would die. But the serpent told Eve, don't listen to God. You won't die. So she ate the fruit and gave some to Adam. After they ate the fruit, they suddenly discovered they were naked and covered themselves with fig leaves, but this was a dead giveaway to God, who quickly wrung a confession out of them and sent a serpent Eve and Adam to various punishments. That's the second Genesis story in a nutshell. In his text, without the gloss Christians later put on it, it would explain why all humans were mortal, that is, they had to die eventually, why there were two sexes, why life was so hard for each, and how good and evil were something you had to open your eyes to see. So that's the bare bones, so to speak, of the Adam and Eve story, as Jews might have understood it. How old is the Adam and Eve story? We don't know, but it's at least several centuries before the birth of Jesus. After Jesus' life and death, his followers put quite a different spin on this old story. The first Christian writer to deal with it was St. Paul. Paul, trying to interest people in the importance of Jesus after his death, argues to Jews and Gentiles in the first century CE that Jesus of Nazareth, who had been executed by crucifixion a few years earlier, was the promised Messiah. The problem with that was that Jews hoped for a military Messiah who would throw off the Roman yoke of oppression, much as the Maccabees had done a few centuries before. But this man, Jesus, was clearly no Maccabee. He was utterly defeated militarily and suffered death by a most cruel and degrading manner. So Paul cast Jesus as a spiritual warrior and proclaims him in him the new Adam, quote, for as in Adam all die, so even in Christ shall all be made alive, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Adam and Eve made a big mistake for humanity thousands of years before in Eden, but Jesus' death on the cross would atone for that sin and all the others committed in the meantime. Three centuries later, St. Augustine takes up this suggestion in Paul and expands it into the doctrine we call original sin. In this doctrine, Adam and Eve's act in disobeying God is sort of like the Big Bang, whose background radiation is still reverberating in the universe. We can't escape the clutches of sin. Every human being partakes of Adam and Eve's sin, Augustine says, and this will condemn most of us to hell. The only ones saved are the ones on whom God arbitrarily bestows grace. We all deserve eternal punishment and most of us suffer it. Even babies and those who have never heard of Jesus will go to hell when they die. And like original sin, the grace which saves some from eternal damnation is not earned. There's nothing you can do to buy it. It has to be dispensed from God out of God's mercy. Then more than a thousand years after Augustine, these ideas get taken up by John Calvin, the second most important figure in the Protestant Reformation. It becomes the basis on which our Puritan forebears came to these shores. In the first great awakening in the 18th century New England, Jonathan Edwards was a great proponent of original sin. As a matter of fact, he was working on a defense of that doctrine at his death. But he recognized that it was an uphill struggle, for the whole story was at war with the cultural and intellectual movement we call the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment favors knowledge. Knowledge is a good thing. Eve can be seen as the first theologian, or maybe the first scientist. She wanted to know about good and evil. How can we base the damnation of the human race on a bit of knowledge? You use our enlightenment faith. As I said before, both American Unitarianism and Universalism sprang from the Enlightenment. And that movement gave us modern science and the Industrial Revolution, the enthronement of reason, and the disenthronement of supernatural explanations for things. 
there's an excellent history of both our denominations, both of our denominations done in the 1980s by David Robinson, who is no relation to me. It is called the Unitarians and the Universalists. In his first chapter about early Unitarian moral, moral theory, he looks at a lecture by Ebenezer Gay of this church at Harvard, part of that university's Dudleyan lecture series. We read excerpts, excerpts from this lecture in the UU 101 class last week. The subject was on natural religion versus revealed religion. Here's what David Robinson has to say, quote, Gay's Dudleyan lecture suggested that rationalism, even when its primary concern was the intellectual groundwork of Christian belief, carried with it a certain impulse toward moral philosophy. That in a penetration of rationalism and moralism is even more striking when we examine the unraveling of Calvinist New England's 18th century orthodoxy and the growing tendency toward moral perfectionism among the Arminians who led the opposition to the prevailing orthodoxy. Continuing the quote, the liberal attitude on Calvinism took two forms, one of which is exemplified in the pastoral career of Gay in Hingham. Although his sympathy was with the liberals, he chose not to introduce controversy and division in his sermons. Instead, he simply ignored Calvin's dogma and preached his own form of liberal Christianity. But there was also an open, another uh, tactic, another stream that was also open condemnation of Calvinism in New England as early as the middle 1750s. Liberals consistently attacked Calvinism on the related issues of, of original sin and election to salvation, doctrines that in their view undermine human moral exertion. The idea of the taint of Adam communicated to all people regardless of their action or character seemed to deny the possibility of the moral life. The idea of God's preordained selection of a few to salvation regardless of their character or action seemed to undercut the motivation for it. The liberals countered, therefore, with a moral system which affirmed human capability as evidenced in the moral sense. And even those writings that did not attack Calvinism by name contributed to the liberal revolt by contributing to a positive counter theory, unquote. David Robinson then focuses in on seven sermons from 1748 preached by Jonathan Mayhew of the West Church in Boston. Mayhew argued that the central moral truth of human existence was a moral law written in our hearts. There's a law written in our hearts. The author expands on this in these words, if the moral sense doctrine encountered skepticism, Mayhew also noted that it undermined the doctrine of original sin as well. And here's a quote from Mayhew. The doctrine of a total ignorance and incapacity to judge of moral and religious truths brought upon mankind by the apostasy of our first parents is without foundation." End quote. So uh, we have a strong movement in the early years of Unitarian thinking to reject the doctrine of original sin. Basically, it didn't seem something that a rational God would do. This, this is my list of why not. First, original sin imposes punishment without fault. Babies who have no moral sense, who did not live long enough to commit any actual sin, will find themselves suffering in the torments of Augustine's hell forever. The universalists also thought this was a bad idea because they, of course, thought that hell was a bad idea. Second, original sin punishes the children for the sins of the fathers and mothers going back hundreds of generations. There is a raging debate in the Torah as to whether God holds the descendants of sinners responsible for the sins of their ancestors. That strikes the modern moral sensibility as unfair in the extreme. The child has no control over what the parent has done, which may have been done before the child was born. Third, the punishment needs to fit the crime. The act of Adam and Eve in eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was hardly the worst thing that happens in Genesis. A few years later, Cain murders his brother Abel in a fit of jealousy. Yet God allows Cain to live and his only punishment is exile. 
Is taking a human life less blameworthy than eating a piece of fruit? Fourth, in the Enlightenment, knowledge is regarded as generally a good thing, as I've already said. It's a good thing that we're alive in the present age when we have enough knowledge about viruses that science can produce a vaccine against a deadly pandemic within less than a year after its first appearance. And isn't knowledge of good and evil a good thing? How are you going to raise children to know the difference between good and evil if the parent is ignorant of this important distinction? Orthodox Christianity, in this minister's opinion, went off the rails into error in embracing Augustine's doctrine of original sin. And fifth, it had more than a little to do with Augustine's hang-up on sex. For what morally connects the descendants of Eve and Adam to their ancestors' fault in eating the fruit is the impurity of human reproduction, or as St. Augustine called it, concupiscence. And you see that Calvin also took up that word. That messy stuff, that sweaty stuff. Now, I'm not here to say that sex is always benign. It has the potential to cause great oppression and trauma. But it was, at least until recently, the only way to make new humans. So I hold that the rejection of the doctrine of original sin it's articulated by St. Augustine and John Calvin, is basic to the historical development of Unitarianism and Universalism. And in our tradition, I may remind you, the opinion of a minister is just one person's belief. You are all welcome to disagree. I will get to the point. Most of us feel called to do as much as we can to welcome people in those categories who have been historically marginalized. These include BIPOC, that's Black Indian people of color, women, LBGTQ plus people, people with physical and intellectual disabilities, immigrants, and others. We seek justice, diversity, and inclusion, and seek to dismantle or eliminate prejudice based on race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity. Compared to other religions, we are much less interested in salvation and the afterlife for ourselves than we are in building the beloved community for all here on earth. Let's take the issue of race, one of the most central and intractable of our national issues. In June of 2015, there was a horrible mass murder in my adopted home city of Charleston, SC. A young armed white man named Dylan Ruff entered the Mother Emanuel AME Church on Calhoun Street under the pretext of joining a Bible study that was then in progress. And as the study hour drew to a close, he pulled out firearms and killed everybody else who was in attendance, which included the Reverend Clementine Pinckney, Clementi Pinckney, the minister of the church and a state senator for that area. When Dylan Ruff was ac apprehended, it turned out that he was a follower of racist ideologies who intended and expected for his violent action to start a race war. Far from succeeding, his shocking crime actually brought together political factions in the South Carolina public which had resisted change. Among other things, they agreed to take the Confederate flag down from the State House after debating it for 30 years. At a funeral for Reverend Pinckney, President Barack Obama delivered a eulogy which recited some of the proud history of the Mother Emanuel Church as a rallying point for the black people from slavery times to the civil rights movement. He then said this, quote, we do not know whether the killer of Reverend Pinckney and eight others knew all of this history, but he surely sensed the meaning of his violent act. It was an act that drew on a long history of bombs and arson and shots fired at churches, not random, but as a means of control, a way to terrorize and oppress, an act that he imagined would incite fear and recrimination, violence and suspicion, an act that he presumed would deepen divisions that trace back to our nation's original sin. What did President Obama mean by that? He might have been talking about slavery because he places these divisions back deep in our past. Or he might have been talking about racism. 
The two were quite entwined in my reading of the history. Racism as a theory or idea that black people are inherently inferior to white people in intelligence, morals, and culture. May go back four or 500 years, but it only came to the fore as a defense or justification of the institution of slavery in the United States after the American Revolution. Slavery, of course, completely contradicted the idea that all were created equal on which the nation was founded. And while slavery was legally eliminated, eliminated by the post-Civil War constitutional amendments, the racism that had been articulated to defend the institution lived on long after its foundation had been destroyed. Of course, we still wrestle with it today in our public and our private lives. It's absolutely a live and current problem. What do original sin and racism have to do with one another? Though the UUs are known for our doctrinal flexibility in a lot of fields, we have certainly come out in public as being an anti-racist denomination, and our hope is to be a more effective one. Yet racism seems a little bit like original sin in that we can suffer for it even if we do nothing. In Calvinist thought, God decides who is going up and who's going down. And from our enlightenment roots, we are pretty clearly and publicly opposed to most of the doctrines of Calvinism, particularly original sin. A couple of years ago, a historian at Rutgers named James Goodman published an article on the CNN website entitled, It's Time to Stop Calling Slavery America's Original Sin. He started out by pointing out that using this metaphor for slavery conceals more than it reveals. After all, original sin goes back to one action by the first couple, and the rest is out of our hands under Calvin. But slavery was a system which required consistent, constant acts in support of it. Quote, slavery most certainly was committed day after day, not just by enslavers and traders, but by legislators, lawyers, bankers, investors, and insurers, and all those who benefited from the system and did not struggle to end it. Knowing this, knowing that slavery was an institution made by men and women and sustained by men and women, something that people did to other people, why would we continue to employ a metaphor that suggests that slavery was something we inherited, something we were saddled with, something for which no one else was or is responsible? He continues, there's more. The idea of original sin functions not only to absolve enslavers of responsibility for one kind of atrocity, but also to further erase another. European settlers took the land on which enslaved people cultivated tobacco, cotton, and rice from Native Americans. If our British and then American ancestors had a first sin, it surely must include taking that land, which continued for hundreds of years. The making of every great and powerful nation involves a catalog of atrocities. Slavery wasn't the first nor the last of Americas. Comparing atrocities for the purpose of ranking them is always a mistake. Professor Goodman concludes, let's call American slavery what it was, one of the unforgivable crimes against humanity that the people who settled the land that became our nation committed. It was a crime that took myriad strands of black and white abolitionism decades of sectional crisis and a great civil war to destroy. It was a crime that committed over time to other crimes and forms of injustice, racism, race prejudice, lynching, exclusion, segregation, discrimination, and too many forms of inequality to name." Unquote. The making of every great and powerful nation involves a catalog of atrocities. Because we are in 2023 looking backwards, we have to take into account all these catastrophes, though I agree with Professor Goodman that it is sheer folly to try to rank them. As we become more conscious of the complexity of accounting for the injustice of the past, 
We might look longingly at the original idea of original sin because it was so simple. Anyone who is born as a product of a sexual union, that is the whole human race, however innocent or however, however virtuous they may have lived, is subject to eternal torment in hell, and there's nothing anyone except for God can do about it. But if you ask me, if I would trade the complexity of our modern point of view for the simplicity of Calvin or Augustine, the answer would be a firm no. Why? Looking at the history of any form of oppression, racism, sexism, homophobia, etc., we can get a sense of how it developed, and that may help us try to minimize the injustices of the present. We can't fix all the wrongs of the past, but we can do some good during the time we are given. As Longfellow wrote, let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. Amen. Our closing hymn is 190. Light of ages and of nations. Please rise as you're able. Alice, the words are in your order of service. I invite you to play, say them with me in unison. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry our hearts until we are together. May the light around us guide our footsteps and hold us to the best and most righteous that we seek. May the darkness around us nurture our dreams and give us rest so that we may give ourselves to the work of the world. Let us seek to remember the wholeness of our lives, the weaving of light and shadow in this great and astonishing dance 
in which we move. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.